Hello and welcome to Simply Tax. This is your host, Damian Martin, and before we get to the episode today, I have some personal news to share. This will be my last episode of Simply Tax as your host. Hosting this podcast has been an honor and a true joy of mine, and I'd like to sincerely thank you for listening. I may be signing off, but be sure you're subscribed to Foresights for more from Forvis on how you can cut through the static of the tax world. Now, I'm not one who's big on goodbyes, so let's get down to what I enjoy most, simplifying the complex. Back in episode 143 of the podcast, Nick Farr and Tom Holdeman joined me along with Brian Condren, Jeremy Goss, and Garen Morgan to talk all things digital assets. Today, Nick and Tom are back with us to help us further demystify the world of non-fungible tokens. It's a fun conversation that touches on technology, planning, tax, and much more to include an update from Nick at the end of the episode on some of the significant events that have rocked the digital asset space in the last week or so. Enjoy. Nick, why don't we start with you, just the who you are, what you do, and why you're interested in the topic that we're talking about today. So my name is Nick Farr. I'm a national office tax manager with Forvis. Actually, that's national senior tax manager. Congrats again on the recent promotion, Nick. I've been in our national office for a couple of years now and previously served clients. And honestly, I just have a fire lit underneath me for digital assets and just really enjoy the space. And I really believe in the future of the internet. And I will probably dive into to this some too, but just the evolution of the internet right now is moving towards digital assets and just love learning more and more about it. And would love to to really connect with you all too on LinkedIn, especially I, I post a couple uh, updates on what's going on in the market about every two days or so on LinkedIn. So love to connect with you guys there. And I also have a tax background, so I can speak to a lot of the tax situations and those sorts of things that are going on in digital assets too. So that's a little bit about me. I do follow you on LinkedIn and, and you are frequently in my feed because of that. And I will tell you that you do a great job because I, that's my way of, all right, I got to keep up in this space and get crypto Nick over here posting about it. So it's good to go, right? That's right. No, I appreciate that. There's uh, this space moves like hyper fast. Yeah, I mean, does. just so fast that it's so hard to keep up with. And so there's a ton of content out there and it's hard for me to even keep up. So I'm glad that you're getting something out of it. Oh, totally. It, it's huge help. So I, I appreciate that. Tom, how about you? What's your scoop over there? Yeah. Yeah. So maybe just kind of echo what Damien said about Nick. He, he posts great content. Definitely follow him. I think I think his, his tagline is just probably posting about Web3 is, is what it says about him. So that summarizes him on LinkedIn in, in a nutshell and, and definitely got a lot of good articles that I've read that you've posted about. So I appreciate that. A little bit about me is, you know, as a young kid, I was a video gamer. You know, I've always been into technology, video games, that sort of stuff. And now I'm a director in our analytics group where I get to uh, kind of blend my love for analytics and programming and, and accounting kind of all together. So kind of lucky to be to be where I'm at with that. But over the years, you know, as a technologist and, and somebody that just is fascinated by how we can build things as, as humans to automate processes and streamline and create efficiencies. When when I first became aware of, of Bitcoin in 2013, you know, I immediately grabbed the Satoshi white paper and, and read it and was like, wow, this is this is really transformative technology. So so I've been following it for a long time. And a lot of the ideas that were floating around back when I first was looking into this have came to actually exist. So the whole concept of an NFT back then was called colored coins. And it basically was, you know, Bitcoin wasn't created to have this capability, but some people had twisted around the technology a little bit to have a little bit of the, the features uh, that, that currently exist with NFTs, but they weren't very good. They were kind of early prototype sort of thing. So uh, it's been really exciting over the years, just watching the evolution of this space and it's still, I wouldn't say mainstream in terms of functionality, but it's certainly trending there. There's a ton of venture capital flowing into this space. And just within the last couple of years, there's been some really concrete, useful stuff being done in this space. Yeah, that's that's a little bit about me and kind of my perspective on this whole thing. Out of the gate, I, I don't know, Tom, maybe paint a picture here of, you know, I, I hear people talk about Web 3.0 and the topics we'll talk about today. Like, what's the so what? What's the significance here of getting into the details on this stuff? 
that's really what I'm most excited about is where where are we going with this? What's the future state look like? Because we're not there yet. It's not user friendly at this point. You know, the core tech is there. And like I said, the core tech was there back in 2013, but we've built so much since then that I'm even more confident that this this vision that that I saw in 2013 or 2014, not not that I created it, that others created and I just interpreted is coming to fruition. So the, the future state is really what's called Web3. And Nick is is definitely in a better position to probably articulate this. But my simplified version of, of Web3 is kind of like, you know, you've got Facebook and LinkedIn and all these different sites that basically show uh, other people, you know, what you're interested in, what certifications you've got, you know, what kind of history you've got. In Web3, you can kind of think of it like a Facebook that's across all the different websites. So it doesn't have to be just on Facebook, just on LinkedIn. Let's say somebody certifies you on LinkedIn as having a particular skill set. That now is is something that, that you would have control over. And if you went to a different website, you'd be able to post on there that, yes, this person has certified that I have this skill set. I, I, what I really think is going to be cool is things like the CPA designation will be something that you can prove on these websites, as opposed to you just typing, I have a CPA certificate, there will be a way to prove that. Things like digital art, you know, are are kind of what the hot topic is now. I I don't think that's the killer app of these NFTs, but it's a good way to explain what they are. And we'll do that uh, during this podcast. But I I really think it's uh, broader than that. You know, if you want to brag that you're a 20 year season ticket holder uh, with the chiefs organization, you'll, you'll be able to show that on that site and prove that as opposed to just saying that you have that. Um, so I think there's, that's kind of just a couple of cases that I see in the future with this web three thing, but Nick, I'd, I'd really like to see what your vision is. Yeah. It's funny. One of the things I really like to talk about when this gets brought up is the evolution of the internet. There's this video that's been circulating in the web three community recently it's uh, Bill Gates on the David, David Letterman show in 1995. And Bill Gates is trying to explain the internet to David Letterman. And one of the things that David Letterman says is, you know, I heard there's this thing on the internet and it's called email. And you can send a mail document or a piece of wording or whatever across the internet to somebody. And Bill Gates is like, yeah, yeah, you can, you can definitely do that. And David Letterman goes, well, you know, have you ever heard of the USPS? And the the, the crowd just kind of laughs and Bill Gates goes along with along with it. And you can kind of tell he's a little bit annoyed, but like Bill Gates totally gets the vision of the Internet. And so he just kind of brushes it off. And then David Letterman comes back and he says, you know, there's another thing I've heard you can do on the Internet. You can stream baseball games. You can listen to baseball games on the Internet. And Bill Gates comes back and says, yeah, you can definitely do that. And. David Letterman comes back and he goes, have you ever heard of the radio? And it's just kind of funny to watch that video, you know, 27 years later and to think about the evolution of the Internet and how we can't even live our lives or do any work these days without email. And now everyone is streaming not only an audio, but but video. I mean, how many of us have some sort of streaming service uh, that we watch some sort of movies or TV on? So it's just really interesting to to see that vision that Bill Gates had, but so many other people try and just rein it home into what they're comfortable with. And so, yeah, I mean, this evolution of the internet that we're seeing right now, it is a little uncomfortable to certain people, but it's it's where we're headed. And so the way I like to envision it is web one was really when the internet began. And that's where we could go out to the internet and read things and digest information that's been posted to the internet. And then in the the late 90s, early 2000s, we kind of saw the dot-com bubble. That's kind of what has been termed Web 2. And that's where not only could we read things on the internet, but we could also go out and write things to the internet. So that's where blogs got really popular, Facebook, Wikipedia, those sorts of things where not only could you digest information, but you could also post it out there for other people to digest information on the internet. Now what we're seeing with blockchain and digital assets is web three. And that's where we can read, we can write, and now we can own. And so NFTs really give us that opportunity to 
own things on the internet. So let me give you an example. There's this social media platform out there called Lens, and you can go out and anything that you post, you own. And one of the things that the Twitter founder did recently is he took the very first tweet that he ever tweeted and he sold it for millions of dollars. I, I can't think of the number off the top of my head, but he turned it into an NFT and sold it. Well, this new Lens platform, anyone that anything posts is automatically an NFT. It's written to the blockchain. You own it. Okay. There's another video out that's circulating right now of Joe Rogan. And he went out and read the terms and conditions for TikTok. And if you watch this video, it's amazing all the things that TikTok owns of your data just by using TikTok. And I don't remember everything that he talks about, but not only do they own the data within the app that you use, if you sign into TikTok on another device that's maybe not your phone, they also have access to all the data on that device too. So instead of living in a world where all these large corporations are taking all your data and selling it, in Web3, you're going to own it all from the get-go. And you can make that decision if you want to sell it or not. Nick, let me jump in real quick. I, I really like those points. And your story about Bill Gates really triggered something in me that I, I, I want to bring up here because I've, I've heard the same sorts of arguments over the year. Well, why Bitcoin? I've got Venmo. Why worry about a password management solution? I've got LastPass. And that password management solution is something that I find particularly compelling is basically in this Web3 world, you will have it's either going to be like a file on your computer or some space on, on the web where you you're the one with access to it, but you'll be able to connect that to a website. So now if I go to a Facebook, I can say connect my wallet into this website and it's got all those NFTs that I mentioned. But in addition, just websites where NFTs have nothing to do with it. You could just say log in with my wallet, much like you can do with LastPass where you can store 50 different passwords in that. And then as you're hopping from site to site, you know, just use that LastPass app. So what I liked about that Bill Gates story was you, multiple different things. Email, okay, we got the USPS, okay, the streaming service, okay, well, we've got radio. So right now, we've got Venmo, we've got LastPass, we've got going to the, the website to prove that you've got these certificates. All this stuff spread out. But in the Web3 world, you'll have all of this information kind of self-contained within one thing. And and worrying about passwords will be a thing of the past. Sending money to people, how do you do that? It will be a thing of the past. It will be very easy to do. There's just a lot of use cases that may be in and of themselves. You can go, so what? We've already got that solution. But it's, it's going to bring all this stuff together in one easy to use kind of way. And not only enrich how we do things, but make them simpler and more ironically, the word I'm, I'm going to say is centralized, meaning you are, you're the central point of where all this stuff intersects, as opposed to all these different websites being the center point for each individual task. So it's, it's technically decentralized because it's all these different people, but your stuff is going to be centralized with you as opposed to spread across all these different services and websites and, and things like that. Yeah. One of the documentaries I watched was The Social Impact. And it really talks about the impact that social media has on, on us. If you watch that documentary, it's amazing how all these different social media platforms have these algorithms that will suggest things just to drag you into their platform even more or to promote you know, a certain item that they think that you're going to buy. Well, those things are great, you know, especially if you're an online shopper and you just want things to be suggested to you and you want to be reeled into that. But at the same time, when I think about social media platforms, like if I post a, a picture to Facebook or something like that, like who actually owns that photo? It, do I really even own that photo or is it Facebook that owns that photo at that point? You know, if you talk about the ecosystem of the internet and things constantly moving in towards a digital space, like don't you want to be the owner of all of your content? Working with the what's possible and where this is going, all the exciting applications here, Maybe start at some of the basics of, of some of the concepts here and, and some of the, the planning considerations you want to, to have around it. I don't, I don't know which, 
Which of you would like to kind of kick us off here? You know, I think Tom is going to be a great person to kick us off, especially when it comes to NFTs. He can talk about how he took his son's uh, art project and even posted it out there for somebody to buy on the on the blockchain. I think that's a great Very example. Cool. Yeah, so Damien and I had the same idea. You know, neither of us are artists. We thought, hey, why don't we take our son's artwork and try to make it an NFT? I actually did that, but it failed miserably. And I'll, I'll get into that in a moment as to, as to why. You know, the question of what is an NFT, it's a really difficult question to explain in a quick answer. It really takes a little bit to kind of lay the foundation. So so be patient with me as as kind of I explain what an NFT is. And the way I typically like to start is, is by talking about what an NFT is from the perspective of what you already know about an NFT, which is probably for most people, digital art, probably heard of people like Beeple that have sold digital art. So I'm going to actually use that as an example here in a moment. But kind of go even more fundamental than that, I want to start with traditional art so you can kind of get a couple of core concepts that translate into digital art. So, of course, everybody's heard of the Mona Lisa, right? So ownership of the Mona Lisa is very simple. It's do you physically possess the Mona Lisa, right? Ownership is one thing I want to drive home. And then value is the other thing. So what is the value of the Mona Lisa? Well, it's, it's priceless. Okay, so but why, why is that? It's beautiful, first of all, and it's one of a kind. Okay, it's not like there's a thousand of them, which would decrease the value. There's just one of them. And lots of people want it, but only one person can own it. So simple supply and demand. You know, it's, it's got a very high value as a result. Uh, reproductions, on the other hand, are completely worthless. Only the original is worth something. And so the same is true about digital art, okay? Suspend your disbelief just for a moment with me and assume that there is a master database of ownership of digital art. I know you're saying, well, I can copy paste and all that. We'll get to that. But just assume that you can prove that you are the owner of, of one particular piece of art. So we've got the ownership taken care of. With the Mona Lisa, it's physical possession. Here, it's a master database of ownership. And then the value is really the same. If there's a beautiful piece of art from a very talented digital artist, we can all agree that that has a high value, but only if you can prove that you are truly the owner. Again, you can copy-paste. Those reproductions are going to be worthless because you can't prove ownership. Who's a famous digital artist? I've never even heard of this. There are several of these, and Beeple is probably the most famous digital artist. And in case you've never heard of him, he sold an NFT for $69 million last year. Uh, it was kind of a unique thing. He had been making digital art for a very long time. Every day, I think it was for 5,000 days, he'd been making a unique piece of digital art every day. Not masterpieces every day, but but some good, some bad. Just He just kind of forced himself to do that every day uh, as a way to sharpen his, his skills that piece of art that he sold was actually all of those 5,000 pieces of art smashed into one gigantic piece of art. You can kind of think of it like when you go on Google Earth and you can see the earth and then you can zoom, zoom, zoom and get down to the individual houses. It's kind of like that. He had 5,000 pictures that he smashed together in this giant file and he sold that for $69 million. So the, the sheer fact that he's been around 5,000 days to make those dailies tells you he's, he's, been, he's got a track record of existence. Plus, you know, if you look at his client list, he, he makes digital art for folks like Skrillex and Eminem and Katy Perry, you know, when they're up on the stage dancing around and there's, there's cool artwork going on behind them, the videos and stuff. He's made that kind of stuff. He, he's also worked with brands like Coca-Cola and Nike, et cetera. So I'm, I'm telling you all this so that you have an appreciation that this isn't just some guy off the street selling artwork that his son made. This is a guy with a big following. And much like when you've got famous people on Twitter or Facebook, you know, they got the little blue check mark to show that they are indeed that famous person. There's websites out there where you can buy and sell NFTs with that same kind of verification system. So if you go to OpenSea.io, which is an NFT marketplace where you can buy and sell these digital pieces of art, you can be insured that you're buying from this actual guy named Beeple, okay? So I mentioned I made an NFT. I'm clearly not an artist, but my son is. So I thought, well, geez, man, when this NFT market was going crazy, couldn't I just make an NFT and sell it, make a bunch of money? So 
I did. And the way that you can do that is I keep mentioning NFT marketplaces. Think of like eBay, okay? So you can go to eBay and buy and sell stuff. There's a website called OpenSea.io that you can go to. There's one called Rarible that you can go to. All these different websites like eBay, but for NFTs where you can buy and sell these things. And so I did that. It's, it's not a terribly complicated process. The most complicated part is if you don't have crypto yet, getting some crypto from a site like a Coinbase or a Kraken or something like that. But once you have that, you can go to these NFT marketplace websites and it's a pretty straightforward process. You would just fund it with some of your, your crypto by connecting to your wallet. There's a button that says upload art. You know, it's just file browse and point to the file. You fill out some basic information and what price you want to sell it for. And then you execute the transaction. So I did that with my son's artwork. It's it's like some Goombas from Mario. And this just speaks to the rudimentary nature of, of the technology right now. It took a while. Like I kept getting the spinning icon like you get on so many apps as they're loading. And I got frustrated and like hit cancel and hit resend. And anyway, it cost me about 50 bucks per NFT. And that first one went through. And so I actually spent like a hundred bucks just making these silly little NFTs. I'm claiming that they're, they're one of a kind and here I am making two of them. So total blunder, but it was still fun to go through the process and understand how that worked. To this day, I have sold zero of them and they've been out there for over a year at this point. You know, contrast that with the Beeple guy that I was talking about. You know, you go to his website and you're seeing all these high prices for stuff that he's sold things for. You know, you get all these hearts showing that people love his stuff, you know, like the thumbs up on Facebook and things. That was a really critical point about NFTs that I learned through that process, which is that you you can't just be anybody and make an NFT and make it work. I mean, think about Twitter followers and, and Facebook followers and, and all these things. Like the influencers are the people that already have a following, okay? The people that are going to make money or, or be able to generate an NFT and, and create value with it are either people that are already well-known or institutions that are well-established, like the, the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade made some NFTs and sold them. And we'll get into a really interesting story about donations here in a moment as well. But you can't just be anybody off the street. You, you have to already have that following in order to capitalize on, on something like this. So, so how to make money with NFT? Step one is you got to be famous and you got to be trustworthy is the other thing. Famous part, I've, I've explained the trustworthy part. You know, in my case, I made two NFTs when I said I was going to make one. You, you don't want to buy from me because obviously I can't control the technology well enough. But somebody that's that's done this a few times knows how to do that. And if you can trust that they're not going to intentionally do what I did on accident, that's really critical. So you got to be famous and trustworthy. Otherwise, nobody's going to buy your stuff. Step two is you got to actually have created the digital art. And then step three is you got to use that NFT marketplace and some cryptocurrency to create that NFT. To drill in a bit onto like what is actually happening from a technology perspective and uh, apologies for, for those that want, don't want this level of detail, but it's, it's really critical in my opinion to kind of understand a little bit about the underlying technology to really have an appreciation for what's going on. I'm going to explain the tech by kind of starting with Bitcoin, which most people are probably familiar with is if you really distill Bitcoin down, it's really a database with two transaction types. One transaction type is create new Bitcoin, which is programmatically done. It's, it's predetermined. It's not like somebody is making these Bitcoin. And then the second is to transfer Bitcoin from one person to another. I always think about it like an Excel file with two sheets. You know, one sheet is the create new Bitcoin sheet. And the second sheet is the transfer Bitcoin sheet. So just envision in the first sheet, there's three columns. There's a number of units. There's the token type, which is always going to be Bitcoin. And then there's the creator, which when the tokens get created, that's going to be the, the Bitcoin software itself. So it's really simple spreadsheet, three columns, units, Bitcoin, Bitcoin software. Okay. And then for, to transfer those Bitcoin, that second sheet, you, you got to have a running log of all the transactions, right? So first column is number of units. Second column is what the token is, again, which is always going to be Bitcoin, the sender, and so for that initial transaction, right after creation, the sender would be the Bitcoin software. 
and they would be sending it to whoever had contributed to the security of Bitcoin, the miners. So that's the recipient. So in this spreadsheet, there's just four columns, number of units, token, sender, and recipient. Pretty simple. Uh, and that's, that's really, really what Bitcoin is good at, is just tracking the creation of Bitcoin and then the transfers. It's kind of a one-trick pony. But there's all these other blockchains out there that can do a lot more stuff. Bitcoin is, you know, super high security because it just does this one thing. These others are also extremely high security as well, but they're slightly less secure because they do have multiple use cases. And, you know, with Ethereum, which is the one I often reference, it's kind of the number two cryptocurrency behind Bitcoin, can serve as a currency and it has all these other use cases and, and NFT is, is just one of them. The question going back to what is an NFT, the F portion of that is, is fungibility. So non-fungible token is what NFT stands for. With Bitcoin, all the tokens are created by the software. So every Bitcoin looks like all the others. They're fungible. You can exchange one for the other, no problem. And with Ethereum and other cryptocurrency, it is the same thing for the Ethereum token. But what's really cool about these is that as an end user, you can make new tokens, okay? I can go out there and make a token right now and it may not have any value whatsoever, but if Beeple goes out there, makes a token and says that this token represents his artwork, that's what an NFT is. So just to kind of revisit this database concept again to drive this point home, with Ethereum, let's also imagine an Excel spreadsheet with, with just two tabs. And in the first tab, again, we've got units, token, and creator with the Ethereum tokens, the second tab, Ethereum transfers, that's straightforward enough. Okay, now let's imagine you're making a new Excel spreadsheet with a brand new type of token, okay? So within this, your first tab is gonna say number of units. So let's say my piece of artwork is, is one of a kind. So I wanna say I got one unit of a token called whatever it is the piece of art that I'm selling is. So in my case, I called it Goombas by Westo because they were the little Goombas from Mario. So that's what I called that. And then the column that says creator, Tom Haldeman is the creator. That's tab one. Tab two, again, four columns, same basic information, number of units, one, the token, Goombas by Westo. And then the sender, if I were to sell it to somebody, the sender would be me because I'm the sender. And then the recipient would be whoever I'm, I'm buying it from. So in that simple example, you could see how over time, as, as these tokens get transferred, you could always trace them back to, to say, okay, well, it actually came from Tom originally. So that traceability is what makes NFTs so compelling is that that is the master database of ownership, kind of these conceptual Excel files that I'm talking about. You can kind of assume that the tech is there behind it with cryptography to make sure that, you know, there's no funny business going on and there's security concerns and all this. If you kind of just assume that that's taken care of by the software, that's really what the concept of an NFT is. So again, an NFT, the creator isn't the software, it's a unique person creating it. That creator gets to specify what specific digital or real world object that that token represents, real world being a really interesting use case we can talk about in a bit. But that's kind of what it is in a nutshell. So it's, again, just to recap, it's a one-of-a-kind token, which is nothing more than an entry in a database. It represents ownership of either a digital or real-world item. And the prerequisites are that, that you have to have trust that the database is reliable and only going to allow legitimate transfers. And you also have to have familiarity and trust with the creator of the token within that database. So... I know that was a long-winded, like really complicated answer to the question of, of what is an NFT and apologies to those who have nodded off. But uh, if you want to wake up and come back into the conversation, we'll, we'll get back into some really interesting use cases. So I'll, maybe I'll pause there and see if either Nick or Damien, you have any comments or questions related to that. Going back to the Letterman thing, right? It's like, have you ever heard of the USPS? Have you, whatever, right? There's other ways currently to do it, but basically this technology just opens up the door to being able to do it at a scale and a level of confidence that we don't maybe have already, right? Is that, I mean, that's really kind of the idea in a nutshell, right? Because I mean, our, I'm assuming, well, I've heard people say like, well, why do we need that? We've already got ways to verify, you know? 
Twitter, you can get your blue check. I mean, not the exact parallel, but you get what I'm saying. You get, there's ways to verify authenticity. So I don't know what you would say to that in the face of that kind of a Letterman style commentary, I guess. When it comes to authenticity for me, I mean, you, t- you talk about the blue check mark as an example. You're relying on a third party to give you that authenticity. In the example of blockchain, it's all decentralized. You don't need a third party to to verify it. You just need the blockchain and you need the validators of the blockchain to confirm it. And once it's written to the blockchain, it's, it's, it's there. It's immutable. You can't change it. So anybody can go back and reference that. But I don't know, Tom, what are your thoughts on that? I think there's still got to be some mechanism, probably a social mechanism to certify that a person is who they say they are. So I, I think even like, let's say Elon Musk goes out there and, and creates a profile on one of these websites, like probably some of his peers are going to have to certify that that's him. Because right now we're relying on this centralized database to kind of kind of do that. So I, I think it'll be done in just a slightly different way. I think it'll be more of a socialized type of thing where, okay, well, these seven people who all claim to be these seven legitimate people are all interrelatedly saying that, yes, this group is all seven legitimate people. And I don't pretend to have the exact answer to how that functionally would work. But I do think that there will be a protocol that comes out that handles that so that it is decentralized as opposed to centralized. There's a term that's used in the in the community. It's called doxed. That's essentially, you know, your way of saying that you are who you say you are in the Web3 community, because a lot of people use avatars or they'll, you know, use their wallet addresses to kind of identify who they are. But if you've been, quote unquote, doxed, that means that you've been verified, essentially. So I, I do have one other use case question for you. So like Tom, like you mentioned the, you know, just the affinity for for video games and, and just the interest, you know, early on and whatnot. I mean, is there a use case for NFTs kind of as it relates to I mean, video games or even kind of like metaverse as, as there's conversations there? I want to start with kind of more of an old school example, and then I'll flip it to Nick to talk about uh, Axie Infinity, which is a, a really cool uh, example of that. The old school example, there was a game called Crypto Kitties to where you could buy a cat and then, you know, if somebody else has a cat, I think you could like crossbreed them and generate a new NFT that's like kind of randomly generated based on the DNA of those two cats. And so it wasn't really as much of a game as kind of a parlor trick sort of fun thing, you know, not really a a game as as you think of it with a joystick and all that sort of stuff. But there is there is a joystick kind of game called Axie Infinity. and, And I know Nick knows a lot more about this than I do. So I'll let him speak to that. Yeah, so Axie Infinity uh, got really hot in 2021, and it's essentially just the Web3 version of Pokemon, if you will, where you can generate these axes is what they're called in in this game instead of Pokemons, if you will. And you build them up, they get certain traits, you can trade them, so on and so forth. But instead of, you know, at all living within the game ecosystem, you can earn actual tokens and you can earn their native token and then transfer that back to your wallet and then transfer that to, you know, US dollars or, you know, whatever country you're living in and, you, and, and trade that back to your native currency. And there was examples of people in the Philippines making, you know, hundreds of dollars a day just by playing this game. And it was great. But given the recent volatility we've seen in the, in the space, the token has, you know, lost 90% of its value, probably even more than 90%. And people are making, you know, maybe $3 a day now playing Axie Infinity. Now it's, it's still a way to play to earn. And, and so it's still a way to play a game to earn money, but uh, it's not nearly as lucrative as what it once was. There's also other examples of this kind of movement. So Stepin, S-T-E-P-N is another one. It's, it's a uh, move to earn concept. So you, you can download an app on your phone and you can purchase these digital shoes that are represented with an NFT. And when you turn on the app and you, you start to either walk or run with these digital shoes that you buy, you accrue tokens. And so it's a way to incentivize you to, to go out there and walk and run and be active, which is a really neat concept. And you earn tokens in the process, or you can you know buy multiple of these digital shoes and, and mint new shoes and sell those on the open market to other people that want to walk and run to earn these tokens. So the the play to earn, the move to earn movement is out there. I'd say we're in the very early stages of it. And 
GameFi or, or game finance, however you want to call it, is something that I really believe in and I think will evolve. We really need to focus on the user experience first. And a lot of the game developers are really anti NFTs and crypto right now because the user experience hasn't been great with them. So if we continue to focus on the development and the developers really focus on the user experience, I think that's when we'll really start to see it flourish here in the next several years. I can totally see, you know, you earn a sword that you worked really hard to get in one game and then that sword is transferable to other games that support that, you know, that sort of functionality. I'm confident will be there. Quick point on the failure, quote unquote, of of Axie Infinity, probably not a failure, just kind of a downtrend right now. That's the nature of innovation. There's going to be failures. You, You can't say, well, that failed, it's done, it'll never come back. I mean, people have been saying that ever since I got into this space of, of monitoring crypto. Uh, Bitcoin's dead. I've heard that a thousand times. So yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take that as a negative, the downtrend that we see there. The other really critical point I wanted to make is when you said that a lot of the developers, uh, video game developers are kind of not too excited about NFTs right now, and, the, and it's because the user experience is poor, User experience is poor, number one, because stuff hasn't been developed, but number two, also due to capacity. You know, these blockchains, the way that they're currently structured, can only handle so many transactions. They've only got so much speed. And just the other day, I was listening to a podcast with John Carmack, who uh, was one of the the guys who made like Doom and Quake and a lot of those video games at, at id Software back in the day, really a pioneer in the video games industry. And he was talking about, he got asked a question about a really detailed coding question. And basically his response was, you know, back in the day when this stuff was new, every line of code was precious. You had to be very careful with how you wrote these things because the processing power wasn't there. So we had to be hyper, hyper efficient. And he was like, the processing power of computers today is just absolutely mind boggling. There's no way 20 years ago we could have anticipated the capacity, both in terms of processing power, as well as hard disk space. And so in another 20 years, we're going to be orders of magnitude beyond where we are currently with our capacity to process transactions and store them. And so these problems that video game developers have with NFT, they'll dissolve over time. You know, it's just just the nature of of technology and, and how speed and capacity increases over time. Yeah, I'd love to get in some of these examples, Tom, of communities that have created their own NFT collectibles and use them not only just to sell digital art, but actually for a purpose. And I think that's when I get really excited when we talk about NFTs are utility NFTs and access NFTs and some of these NFTs that have actual value other than a piece of digital art. So I think you have a really good one with pool together, right? Yeah. So that's a really interesting use case of how they used NFTs to, to help themselves get out of a bind. So Pool Together is a crypto organization that their value proposition and the thing that they did was they were trying to get people into the crypto space. So they were like, what kind of a cool, fun, sort of gimmicky thing can we do to get people into this space? And what they did was they said, okay, if a user wants to deposit their crypto with us, we'll hold that crypto And then every day we'll have a lottery where anybody who holds their crypto with us has a lottery ticket and whoever wins gets the interest that they earned from that crypto. Because what they were doing is they would take that crypto, invest it and get a rate of return. And so, you know, whatever interest they got, they would just kind of randomly give to one of the people. So it was just kind of a fun, fun little thing that they made. It was kind of beloved in the crypto industry. Well, in a litigious society like we live in, somebody got upset and said, hey, you're operating an illegal lottery in the state of New York, so I'm going to slap you with a lawsuit. And so they got really bogged down with legal fees. And it's it's really unfortunate, but the hero of the day was the NFTs that they came up with. They, they said, hey, community, we need your help. They created three NFTs. One was called like a judge and one was called like an attorney. And, you know, they came up with some interesting names that, that tied to their legal defense. And they're, they're trying to raise money for their legal defense. And they sold these NFTs with a target of raising like a million bucks to, to help them defend themselves. And obviously that resonated really well since they were a crypto native company and they were very successful and ended up raising over the million dollars that they had originally set out to do. 
I just think that was real world people coming together to help each other out. And now the cool thing is, is whoever bought those NFTs can kind of virtue signal to other people that, hey, I was in on the ground level of this thing. I put my money where my mouth was. And, you know, this really resonated well with a conversation that we had with some people in the university donor space. The people we were talking with would go out and get donations from people and they'd put their names on buildings and things like that. You can think at any any university, there's all kinds of people's names on buildings. It's, It's because some of these people that have some money want to be tied to their alma mater. They want to prove that they've supported their alma mater so they get their name on the building. My pitch to them was, well, have you ever thought about making an NFT where, you know, you sell a million dollar NFT and somebody wants to be tied to the university, you, you sell it as the university's account. So now the, the person can prove that they made that million dollar donation. They, they have that NFT that's going to be on their profile that people could see. Like I said, much like a Facebook profile, anybody could see, oh, you donated a million dollars to that organization. So stuff like that, that I never thought of that, you know, until this pool together organization did this to raise money, but all kinds of interesting stuff that just kind of naturally percolates up over time. It's the community for me, honestly, it's, that's what really has to be, you know, emphasized in in any of these NFT drops is like you mentioned with people, he had a following, he had a community that wanted to buy his art. And there's other examples of this too. So like university of Miami, they have their uh, what they call their canes vault and they sell nfts of like their former world championship rings they're just kind of replicas but you can go out to their website and buy these nfts and you get like access to certain things and like a 10 percent chance to win such and such and so they're creating a community because you know they already have fans of their football team right and these other sports communities are there, but now they're driving even more interaction with that community by selling these NFTs. The governor of Colorado actually sold NFTs in a way to drive donations for his campaign. And Senator Blake Masters, I think he's in Arizona, he sold NFTs as well in this kind of same concept. He raised $550,000 in 36 hours. Tiffany and co actually, they just sold some of their NFTs, they sold 12 and a half million worth of NFTs in 30 minutes. Crazy. And there's other brands. Wow. Yeah, we're talking staggering numbers. There's other brands too, like Lamborghini, Louis Vuitton, and the NBA, they have Top Shot. So Top Shot, you can go out there and you know think of a moment in an NBA game that you can really visualize in your mind. Well, they've you know put these in these NFTs and you can own that moment in that game so i don't know think of the the time that you know kobe scored 81 points in a game you can go out there and purchase that as an nft and say that you own that i am curious because i know when i've had some conversations with people that maybe would say all right i want to buy that the kobe 81 point uh, game moment and then you know thinking that well maybe that's going to appreciate in value and i'd you know be able to do something with so i have have two questions here one is so if I'm the I'm the NBA or, or Lakers at the time, right? And, and you got the the game, you know, and I sold that. What's the impact to me from like a tax perspective, or how how does that work? And then maybe then we can also talk about just kind of the investing aspect of this because I, I know there have been people that have kind of flocked to it for that reason. Either one you could start with there. You know, there's definitely a couple of angles you can take these NFTs. You can buy and hold and hope that the the value goes up, and it's great if it does. Uh, you're looking at at probably paying some sort of collectibles tax rate in that in that instance because some of these probably considered collectibles, especially if they're digital art, and that's really the only value that you're getting out of them. So that collectibles rate is going to be 28% tax rate. So something to keep in mind because it's a little bit higher than than your standard capital gains tax rate. You know, in the case that there's other value that you're getting out of these NFTs, you really just have to look at the facts and circumstances there to really determine, you know, what are you paying for? Is it truly even a, uh, a capital gain that you're using it for in that instance? So, you know, we talked about certain examples where, you know, maybe you get access to things like Gary V is another example, Gary Vaynerchuk, if you're familiar with that name, he's selling NFTs right now. And if you buy his NFT, you get access to three years worth of his conferences. So is that truly uh, a collectible or, is this truly an asset that you're going to pay capital gains on? Probably not because you're using that as the ticket into his event. So we kind of just have to look at all the facts and circumstances 
whenever we talk about the, the tax consequences of these things. Yeah, and it, it makes me think of an interesting question too is, you know, in terms of the donation token, whenever they made that donation, they got that token showing that they made that donation. Presumably, the only thing they're going to do with that is to prove that they made that donation. You know, what if they then were to sell that to somebody else? I mean, there's all kinds of interesting questions that we probably haven't, don't have the answers to and haven't thought through. But I do know that you certainly could make an NFT with some stipulations about it. Like maybe it's it's a one-time you can only transfer it once and then it can't go any further than that. This is going beyond my expertise with the tech, but that seems like a simple enough thing that you should be capable of controlling when you create the NFT. Yeah, you, you can even limit the number or the type of wallets that even have access to it. So if you wanted to say like only this subset of wallets can actually purchase NFT, you can code that in there too. That's interesting because I just saw an article about the Bored Apes Yacht Club which the Board Apes Yacht Club is is a very well known NFT collection. I think there's maybe ten thousand of them, or a thousand of them, or something like that. Uh, people like Eminem and Snoop Dogg own these things. I don't know if it was the Tiffany thing that you were talking about before, or something else. But they only allowed people that owned Board Ape Yacht Club NFTs to have access to be able to purchase this particular. Thing that they were selling. I don't even remember if it was an NFT or not, but it, just really interesting that, okay, now there's some value to owning this thing beyond just me saying that I'm the one that owns it. You know, there's the access tokens like Nick was talking about, but also the exclusive ability, the exclusive right to be able to purchase something too. Yeah. Board at Yacht Club, they do a, a ton of stuff that's exclusive to just ownership. They do private events. I've heard of a uh, of Board at Yacht Club doing like a private yacht event it makes sense right a board ape yacht club chris brown actually he released a, a ten thousand collectible nft drop here recently and it's a great example of of a failure in the space because he didn't really involve his community very well he, he thought that you know i'm chris brown i'm a famous artist i have you know several million followers on instagram and twitter and all these other things i can just release an NFT and it's going to, I think his NFTs gave hit the the people that bought them access to like backstage and uh, maybe to do a meet and greet with Chris Brown and those sorts of things. And that's great and all. And, pe and there were some people that were interested in it and it sold maybe 10% of them, but he didn't get his community involved. And, and again, I'm just going to reiterate that it's super important to get your community involved Anytime you're releasing an NFT, you can't just say, hey, I'm going to release these NFTs and expect them to sell right away. So I, I do have a question around, again, just the ownership of them and whatnot. Always got to find the tax angle or the angle. But, you know, like, for example, like when it comes to planning for maybe estate taxes or planning for, you know, liability protection, you know, asset protection, you know, th those sorts of things. H have there been conversations or are there things that you know, in that space, that, you know, and how that interacts with these NFTs that maybe you're running, because like we've said that, you know, there's, there's value associated with them clearly. So what do you do from a planning perspective there? The biggest thing that I like to talk to people about when it comes to digital assets and estate planning is, do you have a plan in place in case something were bad were to happen? And that's important because in digital asset world, if you own your wallet, the true ownership of that is the private key, which is, in other words, a password. If you're the only one that has access to that private key and something bad were to happen to you, how are any of your family members or friends going to figure out how to get access to it? And it's not like one of those websites where you can go in and say, I forgot my password. It sends you an email, you reset it. No, like once you lose your password, you lose your password. So I always encourage anyone that's in the space, you never know what's going to happen. Make sure you have a plan in place just in case that somebody can get access to your private key if they really, really need to. Now I say that with a caveat of you don't really want them to have access to your private key unless that scenario happens, because if they have access to your private key, that also means that they can go in there and steal your funds too. So create a plan in place, but it's going to have to have multiple steps so that they don't actually have access to it immediately. And, and there is this interesting concept too of wallets that require multiple signatures, meaning 
you could set something up to where me and my two friends all go in on a wallet together where maybe I'm saying it's my wallet, but if you guys wouldn't mind making sure if I do pass away that you control this, I could give both of them keys and both of them would have to sign a transaction in order to steal the funds. So in that case, if they colluded, I'd be out of luck. But if I felt like I had a couple of trustworthy friends, there there are things like that that can help with that. And then there's also, you know, obviously it's it's a bittersweet thing using a centralized company to manage this for you. I mean, a lot of people that don't want to get into the tech of it early on will will do that. They'll use a website that will kind of maintain your private keys for you so you don't have to mess with that. But that comes with its own risks. I mean, recently the the organization Voyager, which is a place where you can buy and sell crypto, I had like a hundred bucks on it because Mark Cuban told me to put a hundred bucks on it and they would give me a hundred bucks. So I had 200 bucks on it at one time and it's all in crypto and then they they went bankrupt and now I have zero on it. So there's definitely risks with those as well. But uh, there, there's definitely ways to kind of balance out all these different risks. And I think over time, as things develop out, there will be stuff in place to, to mitigate some of this. But that's that is a really critical point that we really haven't spent much time on, which is this concept of private keys. And if you choose to self-custody, meaning take this ownership really in your own control, that is a number one, something you need to be aware of is, is this concept of maintaining the privacy of your private keys. You know, you even got to think about, you know, if I've got them on my computer at home, is my computer secure from hackers, you know, because if, if you've got a decent amount on there, that's a legitimate concern as well. I don't want to come across as just shilling NFTs or making it sound like you have to go out there and buy an NFT, especially after hearing Tom's experience with Mark Cuban saying that he needed to go out there and, and put some money in Voyager and then them later file for bankruptcy. In the NFT world, there are a ton of collections out there that they just create these 10,000 pieces of digital art. Some of them are considered very rare. Some of them are considered you know common and so on and so forth. There's this concept of being on a white list and these collections like to get other people to promote their collections before they drop. And so they reward those people that promote their collection before it drops by putting them on this whitelist. If you get on this whitelist, you basically get in on the ground floor and you're able to mint these NFTs at a very, usually much lower price. So let's say there's 10,000 NFTs. They put a thousand people on the whitelist they all have access to these NFTs. They're going to be able to mint them for just, let's say as an example, $50. They're going to turn around and sell them almost immediately for way more than that $50. So just be careful of those. Nine times out of 10, if you're going to buy an NFT like right after a drop and you're not on the whitelist, you're probably going to end up paying more and potentially way more than a lot of other people have for them. And that's just simply because they got lucky and they got on that white list. So just be careful of those. Thoughts, maybe areas we haven't covered or, or just kind of thoughts to leave listeners with who are curious and, and ways to approach that. Uh, there's a two part of there. It, it's, it's sort of the catch all of anything maybe we didn't t- cover and uh, what you would leave somebody with here. If this is an area that interests you, definitely know that within four of us, we've got a, a committee of, of folks like me and Nick, two, we're two of the members that that you can reach out to. You can reach out directly to us. You can reach out to any of the committee members. And we've got some expertise within the firm. Like you said, we have people in the firm that have expertise in this area. And the biggest way that I learn is through experience. And Tom, I think you're the same way. And that's kind of why you took your own initiative to just take this art piece that your son did, put it into a digital format and put it out there on OpenSea. And, you know, just because somebody wasn't going to buy it, it wasn't a huge deal to you, but you learned a ton in the process. And I love that way of learning too. I've gone and uh, I took a picture of my dog and used this AI to convert it into kind of a cartoon, if you will, and, and have posted it out there on one of the marketplaces. So it's a great way to learn if you want to learn how to mint an NFT. Now, before we wrap up today, there have been some big headlines in the digital asset world lately with one of the biggest cryptocurrency exchanges declaring bankruptcy. 
So naturally, I gave Crypto Nick a call for a quick follow-up conversation to help us better understand what happened and what it might mean. So Nick, what happened? It all started on November 2nd when Coindesk issued a, a report alleging that Alameda Research, which is a sister company to FTX, was basically insolvent. That their balance sheet was overinflated, and if they were put in a liquidity crunch, that they, they couldn't meet it. And so this you know, caused some people to look into it to see if there was actually anything behind this. Binance, which is the, the largest uh, exchange in the world, actually was an investor, original investor, I think maybe Series A or something like that in FTX. So they actually exited that position a little while ago. As a part of that exit, they got cash and then part of FTX's native token, FTT. Binance essentially had exposure, uh, roughly $600 million or $584 million to be exact. They were like, well, if this report is true, we need to mitigate our risk. So they announced on Twitter that they were going to sell all of their tokens of FTT. And this just created a bank run. Because everyone was like, well, if the largest exchange in the world has exposure to FTX, then we probably should follow suit, right? And just go ahead and liquidate everything that we have related to FTX. If you own funds on FTX, you know, withdraw them as soon as possible. And because FTX was insolvent, they couldn't match all the liquidity requirements. And so essentially it just... Um, filed for bankruptcy uh, at the end of last week, and here we are. So what has that meant, and I guess how do you see that having an impact on kind of just the overall conversation that, you know, we're talking about NFTs, but, you know, just digital assets and, and cryptocurrencies in general, like how is that impacting things? I mean, the first thing is I think it's going to be a, a catalyst for regulation in the U.S. One of the things that has actually been pointed out is that this all could have been prevented if we had had better regulation in the US. FTX is actually organized in the Bahamas. And so Brian Armstrong, who's the CEO of Coinbase, has come out recently and said that 95% of all trading activity in crypto happens offshore. And that's because these other players in the industry are trying to get around uh, the uncertainty of regulation in the US. There's just so much uncertainty from the SEC, from the CFTC, and other policymakers that Businesses don't necessarily know how to operate in the U.S. as it relates to crypto. So I think that'll be one of the biggest things is this will be a catalyst for regulation. And I think most of the industry agrees that we do need some more regulation or at least guidance, right? There's just so much ambiguity right now that it's just hard to know what to do for some of these players. Second thing is I think proof of reserves will become a huge part of centralized custodial businesses. Proof of reserves is basically just a way for those centralized exchanges to say, hey, this is almost like an audit of what we are storing on behalf of our clients. So, you know, if I deposit money into Coinbase, convert it to Bitcoin as an example, and then just leave that Bitcoin on Coinbase's exchange, Coinbase should also have that in reserves, right? And a one-to-one -one ratio. What FTX was doing, which was, poor business operations is they were saying, all right, customer just deposited this into our exchange. We're not going to keep that on a one-to-one -one basis in reserves. And they started loaning that money to their sister company, Alameda Research, and just buying different things with it and, and lost money and all those sorts of things. So that's the second thing is proof of reserves. And then the third thing is just going back to the basic values of the industry. Bitcoin was created in 2009 as a result of the 2008 financial crisis. It was a way to move our trust away from central third parties being in control of our money and giving that power back to ourselves. Now, one of my, my favorite uh, persons in this space is Andres Antonopoulos. You can Google his YouTube videos and I actually want to look up this quote for this episode because I, I, I love this quote. He was actually in 2016 talking about this and was asked to address this exact possibility. So here's the quote. The steering wheel was not invented until 30 years after the autom automobile was introduced. Why? Because the first automobiles had two leather straps that you pulled left to right to move the car, to steer the car. 
they used horse reins to steer cars. That's called skeuomorphic design. It means keeping a shadow of the former past in your new system, failing to see the new dimension and replicating the past. Here's a currency that is not centralized, where your money is your money, your keys, your money, not your keys, not your money. So what is the first thing we do with this new system? We build centralized institutions of custodial control that take other people's money and hold it for them. Well, guess what? The entire system of banking, the entire system of regulation and oversight is based on the simple centuries old understanding that when somebody else holds your money, chances are they're going to run away with it. And the entire system of regulation is designed to prevent that. And yet it still happens all the time. And so of course, if you replicate custodial accounts, exchanges that take other people's Bitcoin and crypto and concentrate it, it happens again. Even worse, because there are no oversight and regulations in most of these spaces. The answer is really simple. Stop centralizing the decentralized currency. Stop trying to replicate the banking past and the future of money. End quote. That's a pretty interesting quote. And I, and I did not know that about the steering wheel either, actually. Now, that, that's going to make me think a little bit differently when I hop in my car next, you know? <laughs> and it just goes back to some of the conversation we've been having and around the whole the whole point of it, I guess, from the perspective of many, right? Yeah. I, I mean, in my opinion, the whole concept around crypto and uh, digital assets, it, it, it's not to avoid regulation. It's not to be a criminal and money launder or any of those things. It's it's truly just to give power back to the people and, and to custody and own and have authority over your own assets versus trusting a third party. Because time and time again, those third parties have let us down. So I do have a, you know, being that we're, you know, the tax minded guys that we are here. So I, I am curious though. So just and maybe it's really straightforward, but those that, that were experiencing losses last week, what does that look like if you had exposure to FTX? It's actually a bad answer. Most of the people that held crypto on FTX are going to be considered an unsecured creditor. And there's going to be bankruptcy proceedings. You know, they filed for Chapter 11. Chapter 11 is you know, the chapter where they hope to continue operations. So it's not Chapter 7 where they're, they're trying to just wind it down. You may still re receive a percentage of your investment if there's money left over after secured creditors have been paid. So let's just say, you know, hypothetically, you, you're going to get 50% on the dollar uh, after everyone's been paid as an unsecured creditor. Can you take a tax deduction for that loss? Yes. Um, so basically, in that example, you'd have a 50% loss, right, on your investment. So if you invest thousand dollars and you get five hundred dollars back you can take that that five hundred dollars on your return as a capital loss right can you take a deduction for a casualty or a theft loss unfortunately no because that was sunset and through 2025 with ticja irc 165 says that you can take a loss for a worthless security but since cryptocurrencies are treated as property, then that code section doesn't apply. And so then you have to really get creative here. And you know, does your investment constitute a loan agreement or a debtor creditor relationship? And, and then at that point, you're going to have to look at the terms and conditions and all the facts and circumstances surrounding it. So, you know, if there is a loan agreement or debtor creditor relationship there, then you could potentially take a non-business bad debt deduction under uh, section 166 um, that would be treated as a short-term capital loss but i will say you know there's extra documentation and extra action that needs to be taken in order to actually be able to take that deduction so it's not as straightforward as just saying you know i lost my money uh, you actually have to try to take action to recoup that loan and those sorts of things so it's not a great answer for a lot of people that lost money. Well, it probably wasn't the uh, the headlines that you were necessarily thinking or uh, perhaps wanting to see, but uh, 
I don't know. Uh, any other kind of thoughts around just the the space at this at this time, kind of given where things are? You know, I think that there is a silver lining here. I think you know, again, we we talked about a few things. We will see regulation. I also think that we will see a, a definite pushback away from centralized exchanges back into emphasizing custody of your own assets, uh, which is good. I mean, that's the value that we were created on in this industry is having authority over your own assets. Um, so I think we will continue to see a push back into that and education just in general. I think you know we'll continue to see more and more education around it. I, I do want to say one more thing, you know, because I think this will be a catalyst for regulation. W- one question I like to ask is like, you know, Damien, would you ever regulate something that you think is going to die? Generally, no, right? Right. So, so there, that's a good, it's a fair. Uh, I see where you're going there, Nick. I see where you're going there. You know? There are a lot of calls in the industry, and, well, even outside the industry, people saying that, well, it's dead now, don't worry about it. But I can't imagine that our policymakers want to regulate something that's just going to die. It's not the first time that's been said. It's not going to be the last time that's been that's going to be said. I'm, I'm pretty sure, you know, so. But you make a good point, right? Because, well, yeah, why, why continue to invest in some, you know, invest resources into, you know, regulating or talking about something that's dead? So there, there you go. Yeah, it's just really unfortunate that people had to lose a lot of money in order for us to get here. Absolutely, it is. So, well, Nick, well, even more reason to to subscribe and follow you on social media because there's there's just a lot to uh, a lot to learn, and like you said, education's key. So another plug for for following you on LinkedIn and, and Twitter. So absolutely, uh, I'd love to connect with everyone there. Well, as Nick said, that's it for now. But please check out the show notes of this episode available at Forbes.com slash Simply Tax to find out how to contact Nick and Tom and to get links to the many additional resources that were mentioned throughout the episode today. Thank you again to Nick, Tom, and all the guests of the podcast over the years. I have grown tremendously both personally and professionally through our conversations. And finally and importantly, Simply Tax wouldn't be what it is today without the tremendous talent of producer Aaron Ferris, the countless hours of listening to me talk when reviewing episodes spent by technical reviewer Jesse Palmer, and by you, the listener. Simply thanks. So until our paths cross again, I'm Damian Martin, and thank you for listening. The information contained in this episode of Simply Tax is based on data available as of the date of its release. Orvis is under no obligation to update this information if changes occur. Applying this information to your specific situation requires careful consideration of all facts and circumstances. Any information provided is not to be considered tax, legal, or financial advice. Please consult your tax, legal, or investment advisor before acting on any matters covered.